hello, everyone. And first of all, I'd just like to thank the speakers, uh, for the organizers for having such a great conference. Uh, so in this talk, I'll present Pigeons, which is a new uh, package that we are developing for distributed sampling from complex distributions. And it enables users to leverage distributed computation, use up to thousands of MPI communicating machines. I'll also describe some of our uh, uh, lessons learned on achieving what we call strong parallelism invariance. And so I'll describe that in detail and some lessons uh, that might be of interest to the general Julia developer. Okay, so uh, pigeons, an overview of pigeons. Um, it is uh, a Julia package for estimating high dimensional integrals using sampling. And for instance, uh, Paul Tita, who is here in the audience today, uh, has been using the underlying algorithm in pigeons called parallel tempering to use it to image black holes. Well, why is this, uh, for example, imaging black holes, there's a, you can obtain a probability distribution on a set of images. Turns out that distribution is very uh, high dimensional and has a complicated structure. And so something like pigeons can be useful to solve this kind of problem. The underlying algorithm has been used in various uh, areas of science and uh, just to list a few, and it has been used in quantum physics, nuclear physics, and so on, and uh, we're excited to make it hopefully accessible uh, to the general user. So Pigeons is designed to be easily distributed on up to thousands of MPI communicating machines, and we have seen, uh, for example, an up to 500 times speed up uh, using 1,000 machines. Uh, communication is necessary for this algorithm, so we can't just run this completely uh, independently on the 1,000 machines. They need to communicate with one another. And we also introduce new coding patterns, as I mentioned, uh, to achieve something called strong parallelism invariance, where the output is identical uh, what, irrespective of how many machines you use and how many threads per machine. So the problem that we're trying to solve, for instance, is you have some distribution, uh, and x is distributed according to this distribution pi, and uh, you want to estimate the mean of some function, say f of x. And this can be expressed as some kind of integral uh, f of x times pi of x, dx, uh, or it can be a sum and so on. And more generally, we handle Lebesgue integrals. And uh, Pigeons allows you to estimate these kinds of integrals and expectations. And it's based on a Monte Carlo uh, algorithm where you obtain samples from this distribution and then you use those samples to estimate these quantities. It turns out that it's actually very easy to use pigeons. So uh, in the Julia package, you can simply call the pigeons function. And you, first of all, you specify what your target distribution is. So in this case, uh, our target is coming from a uh, Turing JL model. So it's very easy. You simply write a Turing model, and then you can wrap it around this Turing lock potential. We allow to interface with various probabilistic uh, programming languages, such as uh, Turing models, Stan models, if you're a Bayesian. Uh, Bayesians often use something called STAN, and uh, custom probability densities, you can also just write your own function, say this is my density of the probability distribution, and also Comrade uh, JL models, which are used for black hole imaging. And then there are also various other uh, arguments that you can supply, such as the random seed and number of samples that you want to obtain. And I mentioned that it is easy to use uh, pigeons uh, with MPI communicating machines, so you can also just have an extra argument that says on equals MPI and how many MPI processes, MPI communicating machines and number of threads per machine. And uh, again, the output is actually identical uh, no matter how many machines you use and threads per machine. So I keep mentioning this uh, kind of strong parallelism invariance and, uh, sure, uh, and it is useful because for the purposes of reproducibility and uh, also for debugging. So you can use pigeons on one machine with one or several threads per machine, or several machines with one or several threads per machine. So we guarantee this identical output uh, and not just a kind of distributional equality or expected value, uh, uh, equality and expected value, uh, the output is actually identical. And I'll highlight two things that might be of interest to the general Julia developer, not just uh, people who are interested in sampling. Uh, one is that floating point arithmetic is not in general associative, and also the use of the threads macro in Julia. So these are the first one in particular, floating point arithmetic, uh, 
uh, might be overlooked if you're first trying to implement something that satisfies this strong parallelism invariance. So adding x and, and then y and z is not the same as x and y and then z. And this has implications for distributed reduction. So whether, uh, for example, suppose you try to sum floating point numbers, say one through eight on eight machines versus two machines. You can imagine going uh, with uh, one floating point number per machine, just as like a very simple example, you're just adding numbers, but um, the order of operations that might happen is you have machines one and two communicate, you get three, um, and machines three and four communicate, you get seven, and so on. You proceed up this tree and you get the answer 36, and the order of operations is indicated by that mathematical expression. But if you have two machines, machine one might sum one through four in its own order, and machine two will sum five through eight in its own order, and then you get another answer again. It should be 36, right? But these answers will, might not be identical. And what we, and it, especially if you're doing something more complicated than addition, then uh, the order actually matters in, what you, in how you're doing these operations. So our solution is to do something different where we have each value that we need to perform an operation on to be a separate leaf node in this reduction tree and then we assign the machines to the nodes of that tree um, to make sure that the operations occur in exactly the same order. So here this is the same figure uh, as before on the left side, but we're just using colors to indicate different machines. But now if we have two machines, so two colors, blue and red, um, we're doing the same order of operations even though we just have two machines and uh, now the blue machine essentially is basically communicating with, an, with itself as if there were eight machines present. So we have the same order of operations happening. And another thing that might be overlooked and uh, is the use of the threads macro. So this is just some behavior to be aware of. Maybe it is obvious to you. Um, but if you consider this code where we print the number of threads available and and then generate 10,000 random numbers and store them in a vector and print the last random number. If you're using the threads macro to uh, uh, go through this for loop, whether you use eight threads or one thread, the output, can be, uh, the output will be different. And so to kind of solve this problem specifically in our package, we, introduced, we created a new package as a, on the side, splittable randoms JL, and it's an, a translation of the, of the Java version of that, where you can create a master RNG and then split that to allow for independent, pseudo-independent random number streams. And this can be useful for various applications. And, uh, and in the call to RAND, then you just specify the split R RNG. And the output is the same no matter how many threads you use. So yeah, thank you uh, for listening to this talk. And if you're interested, please visit our GitHub a repository and hopefully forthcoming JCon paper, as well as if you're interested in distributed sampling or sampling algorithms in general, you think pigeons might be useful to you, please give us a star. Uh, it means a lot. And we're small enough now that we can actually uh, take into consider consideration like any features that you want to see. So feel free to talk to me or email me if there's something that you want to see pigeons being capable of doing. Thank you very much. Any questions? You mentioned that you're using parallel tampering, right? Yes. Do we have diagnostics like our point out to use the pictures of the house? Do we have anything to know that I'm actually looking at? Yeah, so it's actually, oh sure. Uh, so the question was about diagnostic output for the algorithm, underlying algorithm uh, that we're using parallel tempering. Yes, yeah, so we're actually using um, a fairly recent uh, like state-of-the-art algorithm called non-reversible parallel tempering and uh, that has been published recently, like two years ago. And we offer various diagnostic output. Uh, there's this thing called uh, the restart rate that we offer as output. And so it indicates, um, so for those, uh, just as a very quick description of parallel tempering, there is a reference distribution that we can sample from and obtain independent samples from, and we let those samples travel to a target which is more complicated. So we have this diagnostic that basically gives you an estimate of something like an effective sample size, except it is uh, more conservative, which is good in the sense that it is uh, more accurate for multimodal distributions, for instance. And so we have various uh, diagnostic output. I didn't put them in these slides uh, because it's a 10 minute talk, but yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, so uh, when you were showing the, I guess, the summation uh, and floating point 
uh, costs when doing distributed uh, workloads. Uh, is, is there any kind of, uh, like the way those Value, the way those values are distributed across the machines, uh, is there any kind of uh, locality thing going on there, or uh, is there any kind of optimization to make sure that like uh, these these nodes are? Yeah. Yeah. So the question was about how are we uh, in the case where let's say you have uh, eight. Uh, nodes, like eight values that you want to perform an operation on, but maybe you don't have eight machines, so you have three or something, so three doesn't, uh, three times anything doesn't, like it doesn't go into eight, right? So like how are you assigning the machines? So uh, it's done in a way so that basically uh, the goal is still to have, uh, you only need to do, like you can yeah, basically uh, optimize this so that it's, you're performing as many in parallel as possible so that you're not waiting, uh, but uh, yeah, I, I won't go into, I guess details, but yeah, we, this is taken into consideration. Yeah. yeah. Okay. 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 Thank you. Um, we now have uh, Jose Storopoli uh, with his talk, writing a Julia data science book like a software engineer. Okay, so hello everyone. Uh, so what is the Julia Data Science book? So let me just briefly show you here and then I can start my talk. Uh, so this is the book. Uh, it is pretty much uh, available in uh, PDF and HTML. And you can check it out at juliadatascience.io. So the book was written by me, uh, Rick, and Lazarum. And the whole idea was not only uh, to write a book, but do it in a different way that the book remains uh, up, up to date with Julia and other issues. So it is a free open source and open access book. It has a Creative Commons license. It teaches not only Julia, but also data frames, data frames meta, Maki and Algebra of Graphics, and our target audience are mostly PhD students, but anyone is welcome as an audience for the book. Uh, it is mainly in English, but thanks for, to these amazing people, it was uh, translated by vo uh, volunteers to Chinese and Portuguese translations, and we are also accepting and looking for other uh, languages for translations as, as well, so feel free to reach us. And how did it happen? So we wanted to do a book, but first of all, we had to do some yak shaving. And there is like a small footnote for those who don't, who don't know this expression. It's very popular in software development. And first we had to create a Julia package to do, uh, to, to like present a book. And that's where uh, books.jl, which is originally from uh, Rick, it's a package that uses all of those chills, Pandoc, Pandoc Crossref, Tectonic, that generates books and other HTML, PDF, or Latex uh, documents. And since it uses, it uses a Pandoc under the hood, I think it also supports other types of documents. And what it does, it uh, does the proper embeddings of a lot of things like data frames as tables, HTML tables or uh, Latex tables, and plots as very uh, good plots in either HTML or PDF format. So we had not only to develop this, Rick did mostly of the heavy lifting, I was also finding bugs and annoying him all the time. Uh, so once we had books.jl that was ready to do this, uh, we wanted uh, the book to be built, it, to build itself in a CI CD pipeline. And the book, it uh, automatically builds itself and deploys both the HTML and the PDF versions to the Julia Data Science uh, website and also to the GitHub repo as artifacts. Uh, this is also uh, programmed to run um, uh, chronologically, so we know if data frames 1.7 breaks something, we know uh, that we, we can fix this so the books remains up to date. We had some challenges with Maki because it's a uh, it's a non-display uh, runner in GitHub, but Maki doc uh, documentations 
have good examples how to circumvent that. And also we had some challenges with integrating this with the Chinese and Portuguese translations because all of those need to be in the same CI CD pipeline. Uh, the good thing is that the content was created and it's being edited as PR. So all of the discussions, uh, all of the ways that we are presenting new concepts to users, uh, it's pretty much like an ongoing discussions between the co-authors but also the community. So you are all invited to participate, open issues or discuss in the PRs and also uh, contribute it. We have not only us three doing the authoring but we had some contributions for other people. So this is uh, really nice, all of the PRs you can pretty much uh, go in the history backlog and see what were the decisions that we took and why we took those decisions. So it's it's open, it's transparent. Uh, we also use, I, mo I mainly use the project management tools in GitHub to track our status. So for the first edition, for the second edition, and we are still kind of using this. So it's a nice tool. You can check also in GitHub how to do this. And that's it. Uh, Please uh, check us out at juliadatascience.io. Share the book, it's free, uh, both the HTML and PDF versions. And if you find something, a typo, or something that you think needs uh, more polishing, feel free to either open an issue or a PR. Thank you, and questions. So the question was, what, what kind of platform or file types that we use to write the book? So books.jl uses uh, markdown files with a certain uh, kinds of snippets. So we mostly use markdown files, so it's highly accessible. And there, there are like ways for you to do fancy code blocks that books.jl will, will run, evaluate that code block, and then it will bring uh, the result into the book, and you can also do post-processing inside that code block. So can anyone use that book to write their own books? Yes, not only books, but also reports, theses, papers, and everything else. Um, yeah, how the bibliography is handled? Uh, it is handled. I, I, I think that might, might be a citations.bip, so a bip text citation. I think that is very okay because I don't have traumas or issues with the bibliographies from that, from what I, what I uh, remember from the writing of the book. So it, I think it works pretty okay because we do have some citations and it was pretty straightforward to incorporate them. Just one thing that I forgot, even this uh, book cover, it was done everything in Maki. So even the book cover, it's like Maki code that you can pretty much hack into it and, and do all of those fancy plots here as well. <laughs> 